Grey wolves that change the course of rivers, Eurasian beavers that create wetlands, or European bison that open up meadows. These animals all have something in common. They are keystone species that have outsized impacts on their ecosystems, supporting many other species in the process. Here at Mossy Earth, we've spent hundreds of thousands on projects revolving around keystone species of all shapes and sizes. And if you weren't familiar with that term, you might wonder why. So we've decided to start a new series, highlighting the keystone species that feature in our projects and analysing how they impact their respective ecosystems. But first, what actually is a keystone species? The concept was first introduced in 1969 by the American ecologist Robert T. Payne to explain the results of an experiment in his 1966 paper Food Web Complexity and Species Diversity. In this experiment, Payne removed the purple sea star from a stretch of intertidal habitat and monitored how the ecosystem changed. Over time, he noticed that one of the primary prey species of the sea star, the California mussel, grew in numbers and crowded out seven other primary species, while providing a more suitable habitat for species that relied on the mussels. With the removal of just one species, the ecosystem had changed drastically. Some species completely disappeared, while others thrived despite not necessarily having any direct interaction with the sea star. And so to describe this effect, the term keystone species was introduced, named after the uppermost stone on an archway that locks everything into position. If you remove a keystone species, its associated ecosystem would be drastically different and could even collapse outright. Some of the most well-known examples are predator species that control populations and prevent overcrowding and overgrazing. For example, wolves, lynx, or in our case here, the purple sea star. But there are countless other ways that a species can be essential to an ecosystem. And on that note, to find today's highlighted species, let's look at Scotland, where we're working on restoring European flat oysters, also known as Ishir, in case anyone out there wanted to hear a Scots garlic word in a Southern English accent. We're working to bring these back to the Cromarty Firth in partnership with local community group Murray Ocean Community. And unfortunately, this is a location where you can see the consequences of removing a keystone species. Historical records show that oysters were once bountiful in these firths, but largely due to over-harvesting and pollution, they've disappeared not only from these waters, but from much of their native range as a whole. Over the last 250 years, 95% of the UK's flat oyster population has been lost. Yet despite this decline, poaching still remains a big risk for the few remaining populations, and so most oyster locations in the UK need to be kept a secret. Which is why when we went to one of these locations to film the oysters, we had to film at this weird angle. This is so exciting because we have native oysters here in Scotland. You can see how this one here has settled down onto this cockle shell here. I mean, na native oysters prefer to settle down on onto other shells, but this shows that there are oysters here that are actually breeding and they are being able to settle out here. So I think this gives us hope that there are other places that we could actually start reintroducing these. Focusing on a keystone species, whether it's restoring one to an area or simply protecting and supporting what's already there, is a good way to ensure that an intervention has an outsized impact. But if someone still only sees an oyster as a potential resource to be exploited, it'd be pretty easy to destroy a reintroduction project far faster than we can undertake it. Flat oysters are a protected species in the UK, but oyster meat is somehow a delicacy and pearls are shiny, so local support is essential for these things to work, and education about these species and our projects is a crucial part of that. Second only to actually getting the funding in the first place, since we're 100% funded by our membership. That's also pretty crucial. So I'll quickly take this opportunity to say if you like what we do, you can learn more about becoming a member over on our website at mossy.earth. If you asked the general population to name a type of marine habitat, you'd most likely hear about coral reefs, kelp forests, and maybe seagrass meadows. But when undisturbed and in large numbers, oysters grow together to form oyster reefs, a far less appreciated ecosystem and yet one of the most important and most threatened marine habitats. These reefs consist of a mix of living oysters and empty shells, increasing the surface area of the sea floor and providing food and shelter for an innumerable amount of marine life. They also act as a suitable nursery for juvenile fish, providing the shelter many species desperately need to survive into adulthood. 
The few surviving populations in the UK are quite small, including the one where we filmed all this footage, and most of them fall into stages 0 or 1 in the Oyster Manual, meaning they're too small to be considered a functioning habitat. But when populations are at healthy levels, the reefs they form can grow to be massive, containing millions of oysters and raising the sea floor by up to 6 metres. Ultimately, they can stretch so far that they end up protecting shorelines from strong waves and can help combat coastal erosion. I mean, to, to have the, these oyster reefs, you know, the, the remaining ones, I mean, they're very small. I mean, I don't think you could even class them as, as oyster beds because there's, there's, there's not enough population here. But it does show, you know, the, 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 the possibilities that we have here in Scotland to, to recreate these, uh, the, these habitats that we have lost. Uh, and I think that's that's really the important thing and, and coming to places like this really kind of inspires me to actually think about doing this kind of thing out over towards the east kind of where, where I live because I think it's an important habitat to to bring back. Another crucial feature of these oysters is that they act as biofilters. As you can see in this video from the University of Hong Kong, through the process of filter feeding, these oysters clean and improve the clarity of the water they live in. A single adult European flat oyster can filter up to 240 litres of water a day, and in large enough numbers could quickly turn areas like this from an opaque brown sludge to much clearer and cleaner waters. A crystal clear ocean isn't just appealing to us humans, as the cleaner the water is, the more sunlight will be let through for marine species that rely on the sun, such as seagrasses. This means that they're better able to photosynthesize and survive, and as important sources of food, shelter and oxygen, these seagrass meadows form an incredibly important habitat in their own right that's less able to thrive here without the oysters. Unfortunately, there aren't many places you can see oysters effectively in action like this anymore, and this is a problem with oyster species found all around the world. A 2011 study estimated that 85% of these habitats worldwide have been lost over the past 150 years, with one third of the remaining ones no longer functioning as ecosystems. So this is a massive problem, and while oysters have been getting more attention in recent years, it's a problem that generally still remains largely underfunded and unnoticed. The recovery of oysters in places like the Cromarty Firth would not only have a huge positive impact on the local ecosystem, but likely also on people too. More effective nurseries would likely lead to larger fish stocks, and down the line the sustainable harvest of oysters is a potential income source too. Speaking as someone who lives in a coastal area, less coastal erosion and a cleaner ocean are also two particularly attractive concepts. Bringing a species like this back is so much more complex than just dropping them in the sea, and oyster reefs take a lot of time to build up. But around the Cromarty, we found a very enthusiastic community who want to actively participate in our restoration efforts, so we're confident that we'll get there eventually. In the next video in this series, we are off to Ecuador, where we'll meet a mysterious tree killer that's crucial for the survival of countless rainforest species. Thank you for watching, and until next time, cheers.